the x-ray of Jason Poe's body. According to Trent Williams, he's got that dog in him. So we have here an x-ray with that dog in him. And the question is, is the 49ers undrafted fullback slash tight end slash offensive lineman about to beat out the 48th pick from 2021, Aaron Banks, for uh, a spot. Now, if you need some reminder on Jason Poe, John, let's go down. Memory lane. University, memory lane. offensive line slash fullback. 300 pounds, 6'1". And here comes the tape. For those of you listening to the podcast, I would encourage you, you can uh, skip ahead to the 45-minute mark of the uh, YouTube, which is where we are, or just type in Jason Poe for video of his. This was all his pre-draft workout. And I went back and looked at some of the stuff said about him before the draft. Daniel Jeremiah did a video on him. Uh, Todd McShay had some comments about him. He had some pre-draft buzz. For a guy listed as guard slash fullback from Mercer, this would be a cr- pretty incredible upset if he could get himself in the starting lineup for the 49ers. Well, let's just say this. These type stories are the number one highlight of any training camp. When a guy like this, what you're showing right here, him tweeting out his shit and linking McShay, some different draft people, PFF, I think this put him on their radar. Like I don't think before this video came out, anyone was talking about him. I didn't. I had forgotten till you had tipped my memory. But as I had forgotten, as it was kind of clear, this guy might not only make the team, he might start. I texted a couple of people. I'm like, this guy go to the combine or the senior bowl? Both responses were LOL. No guy. He didn't sniff. No one fucking knew about this guy. Honestly. Did the 49ers think that he'd have a chance to start when they signed him? Of course not. But I watched a six-minute cut-up of the two games. Yeah. He, if, if I was looking at it, and this is what I used to do when I worked in the NFL this time of year, write up guys like him. Is he a claimable player or a practice squadable player? He is a claimable player. He, he is. Like, he's not bad. I mean, he clearly can move. He's powerful in the run game. The knock, obviously, is he's just very small. 6'1 at line is, especially a guard. I mean, think about some of these guards now. 6'3", 6'4". But he is powerful and he's quick. And in this scheme, you just got to be able to move your feet. Now, the one knock, I was texting with a couple people that watched him a little bit, is just going to be like, okay, pass protection once the season starts against every week, you know, Aaron Donald, Fletcher Cox, DeForest Buckner, Eric Armstead, like obviously Eric's on his team, but you know what I mean, just on these other teams. The, every team has, you know, some penetrating interior guys. Like that's a big step up from Mercer College. Here's the other thing. The, their two start, starting guards might be from UTSA and Mercer. And I've been saying this the whole fucking time. I refuse to get worked up over guards and centers because this is where you find them. Now, it's still, that's a pretty, it's going to be a pretty, you know, big step up and there are going to be some growing pains for both guys. There's just no way around. And there would be for a guy from Alabama in the fifth round, but that's, it's pretty crazy. It's it's an incredible story. It it really, it's the coolest story by far than the 49ers training camp, right? If this guy starts at guard and beats out, I don't know, a second round pick from Notre Dame, (laughs) who was a, who was a multi-year starter. Isn't it fair to say that under Brian Kelly, Notre Dame kind of became O lineman you, I mean, think about all the offensive linemen they were pumping out over the last decade. It was a huge, especially the last like six or seven years, as Stanford, who kind of held that with Harbaugh and then early on with Shaw, it kind of pivoted to them. Like they started getting McGlinchey, Quentin Nelson, Aaron Banks, who's from El Cerrito. Those guys were going to Stanford and then and then uh, Brian Kelly and his crew kind of stole them. And this kid's beating that guy out. That's I, regardless of what you think, Aaron Banks. That's fucking nuts. Yeah, which is, somebody asked about his arm length, 32-inch arms. For comparison, Aaron Banks is 33 and an eighth. Spencer Burford is 34 and three-fourth arm length, which is the 94th percentile uh, of arm length. 33 and an eighth was the 42nd percentile uh, for offensive guards for Aaron Banks. So I can only imagine what what 32 is in, in terms of percentile. It's low. Um, it's really low, but that's why he didn't include it on his tweet. That's, you're exactly <laughs> right. Um, and somebody in the chat mentioned there's, you know, they Mercer played Alabama last year, so you can watch some of that tape. 
and um, I saw a highlight from him. Uh, Is it Mercer game. Hoops? Didn't they didn't they beat Duke the one year in the first yeah, round? Yeah, that was Mercer. Yeah. So uh, Macon, Georgia. But here's the thing: he, to make to be the Niners' starting left guard, he doesn't have to block Aaron Bank, uh, Aaron Donald. All he, all it is, is be better than Aaron Banks. And then once you're in the season, maybe Uzcheck helps you out, or maybe you don't need. But that's the whole thing, right? Like I don't know how he's going to play against some of the best NFL defensive linemen. But if he's better than Aaron Banks, then he's better than Aaron Banks. Like yeah. who cares if Aaron Banks' arms are longer? And it's not about how is he really a future. If he's better than Aaron Banks, then he's better than Aaron Banks, and he's your left guard. When you say one thing, I was going to say Kyle and John, but ultimately this, you know, I, I think John would tell you like the starting lineup. That this is Kyle's decision and his coaching staff, and it should be on any healthy team. I would say the number one team at this over the years has always been Bill. Just completely irrelevant once you get on the team, where you're picked, who you are. Like he plays the best guys. I think Kyle has really kind of hung his hat on that early in his career and really since he's gotten here, but like as they've gotten good, he is not beholden yeah. to where you are, how much they're paying you. Cause a lot of teams I think would force feed banks a little bit. And I do respect, you know, you always say this, that like, not you, but just, it's like the, it symbolizes the NFL. It's the great meritocracy. And some players will be like, well, kind of true, but, if I'm a six rounder and that guy's a first rounder, he's getting extra chances. And it's, that is true. But there are some teams that look past that. And one thing that you do not fuck with is Kyle's baby. And what's his baby? The offense. And clearly he's going to play the best guys on the offensive line. Yeah. And the, I would say that here's the thing that this guy and Burford have that banks. This is not, this guy can move and to in this zone scheme. Think of who's the best zone. The ideal offensive lineman is Trent. And obviously Trent, one of the stronger players in the league, but really what separates him is athleticism. Who did Kyle love before Trent got here? Joe Staley. What did Joe hang his hat on? Elite athlete for a tackle. You got to be able to move. I'm watching some clips of this guy against Minnesota. He's just flying. <laughs> and, and this is a scheme also where I think if Banks, just if you just, I, I would imagine is a little more powerful than him. He, he should be. He's just bigger, stronger from Notre Dame. Power is not the name of the game in this offense. And Burford is a guy that, again, a really good athlete. You watch some of the clips, like Banks is not, or I mean, this kid from Mercer Poe is on some pulls, he's knocking guys down, but there's a lot of where he's just kind of getting his body in front. You don't need to like pick the guy up Anthony Munoz style and drive him 12 yards back. You just need to kind of position. And that's where Wilson, I, uh, Mitchell, when he comes back, Ty Davis Price, They'll make the cuts. That, that's the offense. That's it is the most offensive line friendly. We often say it's quarterback friendly, and it is. Like I, I was texting with someone about Brock Purdy. They're like, "Well, I like him. Good kid. He's easy to root for." Even though I guess he kind of struggled last year because we were looking over. They're like, yeah. "He does make some bad decisions. He throws a lot of picks." Yeah, he's he did got, in college. He's got the Favre thing going. The Garoppolo but, thing. I mean, it is Garoppolo esque, but it is quarterback friendly. There are a lot of easy. It's very offensive line friendly. Like there aren't a lot of schemes where it's like, oh, where's your starting guard? We, yeah, we just uh, won four playoff games with a guy from the AAF, right? I mean, the, the Niners. If remember Staley and McGlinchey, the year they went to the Super Bowl, what Joe break a leg and McGlinchey tore an MCL that year. Remember they had backup tackles playing for both those two guys for a large percentage, and they kept winning. It's that's. I remember when I was with the Eagles, you lose an offensive line, and you're like, oh, we're in trouble. Yeah. Because it's like they're not they're not worried about passing it every play. Because that would be a question mark. How's this guy in pass pro just down in, down out? Well, Kyle would be like, I want to ha average like 18 attempts a game. <laughs> and and half of those are going to come off the run. So it's like the, the defensive lineman is not pinning their ears back. And Trey's out of there. Yeah. If needed. We're, we're going to avoid third and long like the plague. L Lamar, I mean, they have played that way when he's been healthy, right? When you have a successful running game, it just it makes it easier on the offensive lineman. Now, if you have Trent or healthy Ronnie Stanley, they're handling. But you got to mix and match some of these other pieces. Then I, I would – it does feel that this kid from Mercer, who literally tweeted himself into existence, tweeted himself into existence, feels like he might start, right? And if I was a betting man – I don't want to say they're out on Aaron Banks, but if this guy's already mixing it, I think we have a pretty good beat on Kyle. Like the Purdy thing, it's clear that he loves him. Now, I'm not saying the difference is I think he likes Sudfeld too. 
I would wonder if they regret the Banks pick and just go, this was, we tried to force this one. It was a need pick and it's just, it wasn't a scheme fit. He just doesn't work. And, and I wonder if in a year, is he one of those, like their version of Lincoln Tomlinson when they trade him to a team that like a Pittsburgh Steelers, a team, a more power team that he's better suited at, you yeah. know, for like a fifth or sixth round pick and just say, listen, he actually might be a solid player in another scheme. He, he just does not fit it. It's what well, we always talk about the baseball analogy, like plug and play. This offense with linemen is not plug and play. If you don't fit from an athletic standpoint, I, I don't think you can play a guy. Brunskill was a was a tight end at San Diego State, kind of like Joe Staley style. He's a good athlete. It's why he can move in the scheme. Well, that's the thing. It doesn't take an expert to watch Jason Poe and just be able to tell that he's got some pretty good feel. I think it's funny. We're talking about this guy starting at offensive guard. His whole highlight tape is him catching the football. Now, part of it in his part of it is like it's just showing how athletic he is. But that's what the, this whole thing that the video he put out is him catching the ball that was a pretty good little texas route i mean let's be real and this is no shot at him because this is not what offensive linemen do aaron banks wouldn't look remotely close to this moving around <laughs> well how yeah what who would i know this trent. you know that you know that thing that uh yeah trent williams you know which heck, kyle's throwing him the ball you know that thing where where you line the tight end up on the left side of the line and uh you leave him uncovered and then he goes out into a route. Remember, they did it with um, the Patriots. Did it on like four straight plays against the Ravens. Not with before they did it with Gronk with uh, the guy with the uh, like Hawaiian last name. Yeah, yeah. I think that guy went to UC Davis. Oh, really? I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Well, I, I could see J Jason Poe's going to be it on the goal line. Somebody is throwing Jason Poe the ball at some point this year if he's on this team. This guy can move. I mean, this is really incredible. I, I think, does Juszczyk get to kind of claim him, fullback? Here's what's cool about something like this. A player like this goes from, like, early on in training camp, when I'm sure he probably looked decent, to go, like, this is pretty cool. Like, I think we got, like, did we just get a practice squad from Mercer to, like, holy shit, is this guy better than Aaron Banks? Like, it, it gets pretty dramatic, zero to 60. Because there had mm. to be a point... Maybe in OTAs, but more likely when the pads come on, like, this guy's not bad, guys. This guy's not bad. To Forrester, like, coach, like, I think this guy can, this guy's got a chance to a week later, like, uh, Kyle, I think we need to have a serious conversation. Uh, do you care if I mix him in with next to Trent? Like, that probably, ha that could have ha transitioned pretty quickly, right? To early on training camp when the pads come on, to within a week, like, Kyle, we're, Let's do this. Let's see if this guy has a yeah, chance. Right. And that is, we talked about this earlier this week. I think that's what makes the NFL pretty cool. And I talk a lot of shit about training camp because the, the star players don't play. But in baseball, how many teams, besides like the shittiest of shitty teams, the majority of baseball teams, how many spots are open on the 25-man roster? Sometimes one or two. In basketball, it's like, usually the 12th guy it's like gary payton or avery bradley it, it, and that's the magic are no different the warriors they have like one spot open in football you might not in theory have that many spots open i would have said like the niners like i don't know how many people are gonna make the team and then all of a sudden like this guy starting this guy starting this guy starting getting rid of this guy this guy's not gonna make it brunskill's a backup and, and the niners are not alone you and i are just living so close to it if we did this for the cardinals for the patriots for the cowboys like Every team has like two guys like, yeah, man, I think this this seventh rounder might start a linebacker for the cap. You know, it just happens in every single program. You know, you're doing college football. You go out to Cal's practice, USC's practice, Texas practice. Every single one is like, yeah, we had this, this freshman, the second year guy. We, you know, we were, you know, he's okay. That last year he came in with a different vision. Now he's our fucking starting tight end. It's a cool part about football. It's just, and part of it is a numbers game, right? There are just more people on the, you have 22 starters. So you just have more bodies. And the difference between a backup and a starter can change. The gap can dramatically close in an off season. In uh, you know, especially in the NFL, as guys get older or just a young guy, it's it's why I never make that big a deal about fifth, sixth, seventh round picks because how fast like an no one in their right mind would have been like, oh yeah, this Poe guy from Mercer, he's he's gonna be a starter. If you would have said that like to John Lynch. Or a Forrester or Kyle, they would have been like, "Shut up, man!" Like this, let's pump the brakes. Well, here's the funny thing: McShay, McShay tweeted on April 11th. Jason Poe is one of my favorite late rounders in this class. We'll be talking this guy 
we'll be talking about this guy Saturday at draft weekend, exclamation point. And then nobody drafted him. What's it, it is hard to draft a six foot one guard center. I'm just saying he had from, hype from, from Mercer. From Mercer. No, no, I, I, I'm not. All I'm saying is there was hype for him, and he still didn't get drafted. Understandably, very small. Maybe he was just trying to get out in front of the. It's listed at six two. I, I wonder how Niners many have him at six one, but McShay had him at six two. Mercer probably had him. I bet whenever the fifty three mans. He'll be the short if he is the starting offensive lineman. He'd be the shortest off starting offensive lineman in the NFL. And and to me, if you're gonna and, and this is what you always say, if you're gonna lean with outliers, you know you're gonna get burned more often than not. And think how you're gonna go an outlier. You're gonna draft an outlier from Mercer. To me, if this guy had been like, you know, a backup at Alabama when a guy had got hurt, he had started a game. Let's not even say Alabama. Let's just say like Oregon State or Fresno State or like a yeah. a Division One program. Mercer? Well, like Russell Wilson is an outlier from Wisconsin. Yeah. Kyler Murray is an outlier from Oklahoma. Who are blue chip guys, also played baseball. They had so much like lineage and, and athleticism. I, I think if this guy would have played at a Division One program, like let's not even use Power 5. Let's just say San Diego State or Fresno State or, you know, some of the teams, not Cincinnati's feels bigger, but like a team like that Cincinnati plays, like an even an FAU or something where guys have consistently been drafted out, out of there in third day, maybe you just have a better feel. And I, I know people will be like, well, Mercer played Alabama. Well, yeah, all small schools play those guys. It's like, I, I don't think that really factors in as much as we think. You well, know? you could watch that tape, right? You, you would. I mean, that'd be, that'd be the only one you'd watch. <laughs> Again. <laughs> But I think it's fair to say if we, you know, not that we would. I mean, this is most we'll ever talk about offensive linemen is let's just say he was okay in that, you know? Yeah. Which would be understandable. I mean, he's, he's going up probably against a second rounder. Did you uh, know Mercer had a football team? You know, I mean, hadn't thought of it. If you would ask me, I would have probably answered no. I probably would have too. I hadn't thought about that. Someone just said in the chat, same size as DJ Jones. It's much easier to project a shorter defensive tackle than it is a short defensive or offensive lineman. Well, maybe if he's not an offensive lineman, you give him to Chris Kasarek uh, and he becomes a defensive lineman. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, you could fucking throw him the ball. I mean, you could use him like seven different positions. What if this guy ends up starting? Maybe that's like why Hokit got. <laughs> it's not. It's like Otani, Otani San. <laughs> what if a dude from Mercer ends up going both ways? <laughs> Just like, oh man, the Niners must be really banged up. It's like, no. <laughs> you remember, you remember in the Rose Bowl uh, against Ohio State, Utah had their running back playing corner, yeah. and yeah. afterwards the guy's like, I know I got burned by Jackson Smith and Jigma. I'm a running back. I'm a running back. Did they move that guy back or did he stay? Yeah, he's back to running back. <laughs> oh, he's okay. a running back. <laughs> they didn't have a choice, right? No, they were just they were stuck. <laughs> Coach, I don't even Bernard. know how to backpedal. What do I do? 